Reason number six. There is a congruency in repentance for sin, though it be not expiatory or satisfactory if we do regard the justice of God or the mercy and grace of God. The justice of God, for if he should pardon sinful and penitent men, though they wallow in all mire and filth that despise his grace and mercy, how could his justice bear it? Though therefore repentance doth not satisfy his justice, yet sins unrepented of cannot be pardoned without injustice, and therefore Christ did not undertake to satisfy the wrath of God in an absolute illimited manner, but in an ordered way, that is, in the way of faith and repentance. Again, it is not beseeming the grace of God to give pardon without repentance, for hereby a floodgate would be open to all profaneness and impiety, and when what sense or taste excuse me, and then what sense or taste could men have of the grace of God, if it were thus exposed to all impenitent as well as repenting, who would magnify grace? Who would desire it? So that you see it is neither agreeing with the mercy or the justice of God to forgive sin before or without repentance. Objection 2. A second objection may be why repentance wrought by the Spirit of God is not enough to remove sin and the guilt of it. What necessity is there that besides this there should be a special and gracious act of God to pardon? Number 1. The answer is from many grounds. First, the scripture makes these two distinct mercies, and therefore ought not to be confounded. God promised to turn the heart unto him, and he will turn to it in the way of pardon, so that a man absolved at the throne of grace hath two distinct benefits for which he is to give God thanks. The one is that he makes him to see his sins, and he humbled for them. The other, that being thus humbled, God giveth him pardon. For although God hath ordered it so, that where the one goeth before, the other shall infallibly follow. Yet all this is of God's goodness. He might have commanded repentance in a deep and broken manner, and, when we had done all, yet might have had no pardon. And therefore it is no thanks to thy repentance, but to God's grace, that thou dost meet with forgiveness. Number two, our repentance is infirm and weak, needing another repentance. Lava Domine, Lacrimus mes, saith he, O Lord, wash my tears. That is only true of Christ's blood, which Ambrose spake in con uh, commendations of water, que lavas omnia nec lavaris, which washeth all things, and art not washed thyself. So that repentance cannot be the remedy to lean upon, for alas, that needeth another remedy, which is the blood of Christ. If, therefore, when asked, How dost thou hope to have thy sins pardoned? Thou answer, because thou repentest, and humblest thyself for thy sins, it will be further demanded. But how dost thou hope to have thy sins of thy repentance taken away? Here all must necessarily be resolved into the blood of Christ. Take heed, then, after sin of trusting in thy own sorrow. It is a most subtle sin. Useless a man be much acquainted with the gospel way, and his own self-emptiness. It is impossible, but that he should look upon his repentance as that which maketh God amends. Number three. If it were possible that our repentance were perfect and without spot, yet that could not take away the guilt of sin committed, because sin is an infinite offense and dishonor to God, and therefore can never be made up by any man, though he should be as holy as angels. For if man had committed one sin only, if the same man should presently be made perfect, perfectly holy, where if he had the holiness of angels and saints communicated to him, all this could not take off the guilt of sin. Neither would all that holiness have as much satisfied God as sin displeased and dishonored him. Hence God sent Christ into the world to make a reparation, and to give a greater good than sin could evil. O oh, therefore, how low must this lay thee in the dust after sin committed! O oh, Lord, could I repent to the highest degree? Could I bring the holiness of men and angels, it could not make up the breach sin hath made upon me. What then shall I think of myself, whose graces may be much perfected and bettered than they are? But you may say, why should not repentance be as great a good and as much honor God as sin is an evil? For when you say sin hath an infinite evil in it, it is meant only objective, because God, against whom it is committed, is an infinite God. Now then, if sin be called infinite, because it turneth from an infinite God, why should not repentance be said to be infinite, because it turneth to an infinite God? 
This hath much puzzled some, and hath made them hold, that repentance hath as much infinite worth in it, because of God, to a man, uh, to whom a man is turned by it, as sin hath infinite evil in it. But there is a vast difference. Because it is enough for sin to have an infinite evil in it, because the offense is done against an infinite God, and so the nature of an offense is according to the object against whom it is, as an offense against a king or emperor is more than against a private man, so that still offenses are more or less as the persons against whom they are be of greater or less dignity. But now it is otherwise in good things that are done by way of satisfaction that arises from the subject, not the object. As now, repentance, though it be a turning to God, who is infinite, yet that cannot have infinite satisfaction, because the subject which doth repent is finite. Therefore this cleareth the difficulty. Offenses arise according to the object, but satisfaction increaseth according to the subject. Hence it is that Christ only could satisfy because he only was an infinite person. Otherwise, if grace or holiness could have done it, angels might have wrought our redemption. Besides, our repentance and turning to God cannot be as meritorious of good as sin is of the punishment. Because of that rule, malum meum and pure malum est and meum est, bonum meum, neque pure, bonum est, neque meum est. Our sins are altogether and only sins, and they are truly ours. But our good things are neither pure good things, nor yet ours, but the gifts of God. Objection number three. The last objection is, why should there be such pressing of mourning and repenting for sin? And that, because it is such an offense to God, for seeing God is all-sufficient and happy enough in himself. Our sins do not hurt him or make him miserable, no more than our graces add to his happiness. But as he is above our graces, so he is also above our sins. Seeing, therefore, God is incapable of any injury, injury from man, why should sin be such an offense? The answer is easy. If you consider the internal attributes of God as justice, wisdom, glory, and happiness, so God can have no loss or injury. For he is always the same happy and immutable, glorious God. But if you consider the external good things that are due to him from men as honor, praise, reverence, etc., these may be taken away from God by the perverse wills and lives of men, and so God have less of his external honor and glory than he hath. Excuse me, less of this external honor and glory than he hath. And although this external honor and reverence doth not make to the internal happiness of God, yet he is pleased with this, and commands it of men, and threatens to punish where it is denied him. And certainly we may not think the scripture doth aggravate sin under this title as an injury to him, as that which offends him, and is disobedience unto him, if so be there were not some reality. Besides the necessity of Christ's death by way of satisfaction, doth necessarily argue that sin in a real offense and dishonor to him, and lastly, excuse me, that sin is a real offense and dishonor to him, and lastly, a sinner as much as lieth in him, depriveth God of all his inward happiness and glory, insomuch that if it were possible, God would be made less happy by our sins. It is no thanks to a sinner that he is not, but it ariseth from his infinite perfections that he cannot. Let the first use be to commend repentance in the necessity of it, if ever we, sh we would have pardon. God hath appointed no other way for thy healing. Never persuade thyself of the pardon of sin, where sin itself hath not been bitter to thee. Besides, where godly sorrow is, there will be earnest prayer and heavenly ascensions of the soul unto God for his pardon. Hence, Zechariah 12, the spirit of prayer and mourning is put together, and Romans 8, prayer and groans unutterable. As the fowls of the heaven were at first created out of the water, so do thy heavenly breathings after God arise from thy humbled and broken soul. It is presumption to expect pardon for that sin, which hath not either actually or habitually been humbled for by thee. If a man should expect health and life, yet never eat or drink, would you not say he tempted God and was a murderer of himself? So if a man hope for pardon, and yet never debase or loathe himself, repenting of his sins, will you not say he is a murderer of his soul? And be encouraged to it, because God hath annexed such a gracious promise to it. He might have filled thee with sorrow here and hereafter. It might be with thee, as the damned angels, who have neither the grace of repentance nor the mercy of pardon. 
Use number two. Not to trust in repentance, but after all thy humiliation still to depend only upon Christ. Though Christ died and was crucified, yet he did not lose his strength and efficacy. This was repented, excuse me, this was represented in that passage of God's providence that a bone of his was not broken. Rely therefore upon Christ wounded for sin, not upon thy own heart that is wounded. Use this, but trust only in Christ. Dependence upon evangelical graces doth evacuate Christ as well as confidence in the law. A man may not only preach the law and the duties thereof to the prejudice of Christ's glory, but also the duties and graces of the gospel. If a man relieth upon his repentance and believing, he maketh justification and salvation to be of works, though it be of faith. For he makes his faith a work, and gives that glory which belongs to Christ to his own repentance.